Okay, so this is going to be a dynamic and exciting session because we have quite a lot of work to do here. Uh, and we're going to talk about thrombotic microangiopathies in pregnancy. And I'm going to, first of all, say to you, we really, really need to be here. There's a really good reason why we're doing this today. So when we look at maternal deaths, we know that thrombosis, venous thromboembolism, is the number one cause of maternal death. We've got a handle on that. But if you look at the statistics, you find that every year, in the small print, somebody has died of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, a thrombotic microangiopathy. Let me tell you about these ladies. So here we are. These are the three that we pulled out. So the first one, a 31-year-old white lady, four days postpartum, very low platelets, a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. She had liver and renal impairment and confused. And she didn't get the diagnosis of TTP made, which is a highly treatable disease once you've made the diagnosis, and she died before the treatment started. The second lady, 29-year-old Afro-Caribbean, second pregnancy, five days postpartum, low platelets, Amaha, hypertension, proteinuria, mild liver impairment, cardiomegaly, confused. Again, another late diagnosis, never got any treatment. And then we've got the last lady who actually had lupus, who had the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and the low platelets, and never got diagnosed whilst she was alive. Now, why are these patients dying? They are dying with TTP because they're getting the process, which Marie Scully is going to talk about, affecting their heart. They're having myocardial infarction due to the platelet aggregates. And it's really timely. Kate and I wrote this paper in 2012, and we haven't really moved on much since then. So the aim of today is to think about getting some guidelines so we pick these ladies up. So I lecture an awful lot to the critical care audience, and this is for those who aren't hematologists, just to remind them where Mahas fit in. So if we get a group of patients, we do a coagulation screen and a full blood count on them because they've got some bleeding problem, we are looking for those who've got a low platelet count and red cell fragments on their film. So this is the type of picture you see. So here we are, these lovely fragmented cells. And then we have got thrombosis going on in the small vessels. The red cells are breaking up over the thrombotic areas, uh, which is why uh, we've got a low platelet count. Now, you can get this picture in people who've got an abnormal coagulation screen. And usually, they have disseminated intravascular coagulation. So we, we can discriminate out those who've got TTP or other Mahas because they've got normal clotting, which is normal fibrinogen, but they will have very low platelet count and fragmented cells, different from DIC, where you've got abnormalities of coagulation. And we need to think about them a lot in pregnancy because pregnancy itself can cause this uh, maha. So when we look at the process of preeclampsia, it is actually activating coagulation, and we can get all sorts of problems. If we think particularly of hemolysis, elevated liver function, and low platelets. We've got a maha. Hemolytic uremic syndrome can occur, and again, DIC. And then we've got to think about other things which aren't necessarily to do with the pregnancy, uh, which we need to look for. So just to remind you that preeclampsia is defined by maternal endothelial activation. So the endothelium in the maternal circulation is telling the blood to clot, and it gets a change of phenotype. So uh, we actually get platelet-activating factors, 
uh, we've got changes in fibrinolysis and we get deposition of fibrin in the maternal spiral arteries. And we will get thrombocytopenia in 18% of uh, preeclampsia. And I'm going to leave it to Lucy to talk further about this. Now, we have within critical care who are really starting to get worried about the fact that they think they're missing TTP, a new diagnostic paradigm. So when we look at people who've got a MAHA with a normal coagulation screen, we really want to know those who've got TTP so we can get on and treat them and save their lives. Then we want to know about those who've got hemolytic uremic syndrome, and Liz is going to talk about those, uh, and they need a different treatment pathway. And then we've got the secondary TMAs, and in the pregnancy patients, we've got a huge list of problems. And then lastly, a very rare group, the atypical HUSs, who have an underlying complement problem. So they're starting to think about it very positively. And the other thing that's happened really in the last two years is that we have a test now with a rapid turnaround time for ADAMIT-13 levels. And we know that TTP is usually a deficiency of ADAMIT-13. And we want to know that quickly. And so lots of labs, like my lab, are offering to do the ADAMIT-13 level very quickly with a five-hour turnaround. So what the um, critical care physicians are thinking about is if they get somebody who's got this picture of a TMA with a normal coagulation screen and who's got a set of symptoms that you might see with TTP, we need to know very quickly, is this TTP, is this uh, HUS? So to do a rapid ADAMIT-13 assay and also look for the causes of HUS. And then you can go down your pathway. If you've got low levels of ADAMITS-13, it's TTP. If you've got normal ADAMITS-13, it's going to be some form of HUS or a secondary TMA. And then uh, if you've got a positive test for the Shiga toxin, you've got D positive HUS. So the whole point of this meeting is to ask this question. We should be producing a guidance, some form of guidance to the obstetricians, to the obstetric hematologists, to say how are we going to get the diagnosis of TTP made and made quickly so that we can go on and treat them. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>